Welcome to Where Her Heart Speaks, a show designed to challenge and disrupt ineffective thoughts and behaviors to help you not only embody peace, joy, calm, and certainty, but also to help you live the life you've always dreamed of living. Where Her Heart Speaks with Coach Catherine begins now. Hey there, it's Coach Catherine. Welcome and welcome back. I am Catherine James, international speaker, best-selling author, trauma-informed coach, and your host for this show, Where Her Heart Speaks. This week or this episode, I am going to do something a little different. As an African-American woman, I believe it is my duty to speak to and recognize Black History Month. So first, I am going to talk about Black History Month, how Black History Month came to be. Now, I assure you, (laughs) this is not going to be a history lesson, just a little snippet about how Black History Month actually came to be. And then... I am feeling called to actually personalize this. This year on February 1st, when I thought about, hey, it's Black History Month, I began to reflect on the contributions that Blacks or African Americans have made to the United States of America. I also began to search, which is something I often do, not just during Black History Month, but I'm more intentional during Black History Month, search for new information because what I know, what many Blacks know is that there is always new information, information that has been left out of the history books. So I am always um, eager to find what information is out there, what information did not make it to the history books. But as I thought about this, um, my search was discontinued because my, my thoughts shifted back to my own Black history. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't span back very far, or at least my knowledge of it doesn't span back very far yet, but I wanted to look at my own history and the contributions that were made into my life that has shaped me and made me who it is that I am. And not only did I want to look at my history, but I wanted to look at a very special individual and pay homage to her. So this message is actually um, titled, The Five Lessons Learned from History. So after I talk about Black History Month, I will talk to you about my history. And my goal is to leave you with five lessons to help you expand. Now this information that I'm sharing regarding Black History Month was actually um, taken from the, or, or produced by the editors of history.com. So I've changed it up just a little bit, but primarily it comes from history.com. If you want to know more about this, I would invite you to go to history.com and click on the tab Black History Month. Black history was established to bring awareness and shine light on how much African Americans has contributed to the formation and continue to contribute to the evolution of the United States. A lot of the history books um, that I read (laughs) that were in the schools that are currently still in schools when um, not only when I was growing up, but currently did not have the full story in terms of America's history. A lot of the contributions, a lot of the creations, the um, patents that were actually founded by African Americans were not included in the history books. So Black History Month was born out 
of Negro History Week, which was founded by historian Carter G. Woodson. Um, not only Carter, Carter G. Woodson, but other notable African Americans and, and an organization that they founded or formed, which was um, formerly known as the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. It's currently known as the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. So Black History Month was born out of Black Negro Week. Okay, um, in 1926, that group, the Association for the Study of Negro, um, 1926, they would have been looking at their old name, um, the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. Okay, that was 1926. So that particular group sponsored the very first National Negro History Week. Okay. By the late 1960s, Negro History Week had evolved and on many of the college campuses, they were celebrating Black history all month long. So Black History Week evolved into Black History Month on college campuses. So it hadn't gone mainstream yet. And then in 1976, the then president, Gerald Ford, made the recognition of Black History Month official. So Black History Month has been official since 1976. And the... Um, celebration or or the uh, reason again that it came to be was to really highlight the contributions that blacks made and continue to make to the United States of America. So now I'm going to switch to my history. <laughs> my history starts at my great grandmother who I affectionately call called Nanny, still call whenever I'm talking about her, I refer to her as Nanny. And I'm guessing <laughs> that she became Nanny because the eldest great grand, my cousin, maybe couldn't say Granny, which is what um, my mom and her siblings called her. She was their grandmother. They called her Granny, but um, the great grands called her Nanny. So to me, she was Nanny. As I speak to my history, I want to speak to the role also of Black grandmothers, the role that Black grandmothers played in the family historically. Historically, Black grandmothers were what I will call the glue. They kept the family together. Um, today, for the most part, grandmothers are the glue. They fill in where needed, becoming primary caregivers if, if necessary. Um, they uh, care for everyone in the family, welcoming and overlooking those that maybe not all want to um, deal with because of some of the choices that they've made. The grandmother, she does what she can to keep her family together to keep her family a family and everyone feeling as though they are in a family. I am ever so grateful for my great grandmother. She, I think, was the epitome of a grandmother. She raised her children. And if I, if I were talking with her, I could hear her now saying reared. Um, we rear children and you raise animals. <laughs> That's some of her words. <laughs> but she reared her children. She reared her grandchildren and me, her great granddaughter. I don't know much about her history other than she was one of 13 children. At least that's what she told me. Now, um, research into our family's history says that there was 11, but because the census records didn't always 
count blacks and babies were not born in hospitals, um, I would guess that there was definitely room for inaccuracies. I know that Nanny picked cotton as a child um, while living with her. She often talked to me about being out in the field and how she had to pick cotton and how her fingers would be pricked by the um, the thorns in, in, in the cotton trees. I know that she, like six million other blacks, fled to the south or fled from the South to the North during the Great Migration. In the 1950s, she left the South and by herself came to California. I know that despite her fight, her inner fight, despite her contributions, the contributions that she made to her family, in addition to rearing her own children, her grandchildren. She also took care of some of her nieces and nephews. Despite those contributions, um, she did not evade Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's. And that brings me to our time together and the lessons that she taught me. Although Alzheimer's was first discovered in the early 1900s, in the 1970s, when elderly people's behavior changed, it was said that they had old, the old people's or old person's disease. Now, at least in my area, my neighborhood, I'll say that. Um, I can only speak to what was going on in my neighborhood as a child. <laughs> and that was a time where we didn't have the internet, so we didn't get to see information that was outside of our immediate surrounding area. So in my neighborhood, the, the people, the adults that were around would say they had the old people's disease. As I think back and knowing what I know, at this age, the old person's disease came up on my nanny, I think pretty early in life. Based on what I can remember in terms of the celebrations for her birthdays and the parties that she was given, I am guessing she was in her early 60s when Alzheimer's started showing up in her life. As a child who worshiped, when I say worshiped, I mean worshiped. <laughs> <laughs> the ground she walked on. I thought nothing of her accusations, the accusations that people were stealing things out of the house when we left or the accusations that they were talking about her and she could hear them talking about her. I remember at times she would tell me, shh, 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 hush up, hush up. And she would say she could hear people talking about her. I thought nothing of that. In fact, I actually believed every word that she said. Now, I couldn't have been any more than five or six years old, so it made sense that I would believe her. She was my everything. She made me feel as though I was her everything. So what she said had to have been true. <laughs> but despite her declining mental status, what I know, even today, what I will declare, she took good care of me, or I will say she loved me and she showed it freely. And that's what I remember. So as I reflected and traveled down memory lane, I thought about all of the many lessons I learned from my nanny. Some were direct lessons and some were indirect lessons. I learned them by, instead of her teaching me directly, I learned them by way of observation. I got to watch her. I got to watch how she moved and how she thought and how she did things, how she handled things. And I'm going to share 
a few of these with you, again, just in hopes of helping you to expand and elevate from where you are. So the first lesson I learned, I will say well, was both directly and indirectly. And I learned to be principled, to be a person of principle and have integrity. My nanny would tell me things like, baby, you have got to do the right thing even when no one else is looking. And then she would throw in a little nugget, I guess I'll call it, (laughs) a little reminder. And even when no one else is looking, remember, God always is. (laughs) She would tell me, If you don't stand for something, you will fall for anything. Know what you stand for. I remember when being principled and a person of integrity was etched in my nervous system. (laughs) I was about eight years old. Back then, children went to the store for their, their parents, at least the kids in my neighborhood did. Our parents would send us to the store to pick up little odds and ends, things that maybe we ran out of um, or something that they didn't have, forgot to get at the store, and they just needed you to run and pick up a little something. So Nanny sent me to the store for a loaf of bread. Now, usually when she sent me to the store, she would give me a little extra change so that I could buy candy. But this time she didn't. So while I waited in line to pay for the bread, I decided to slip a candy bar in my pocket. Unbeknownst to me, (laughs) the cashier saw me. So when it was my turn to pay the cashier, he asked, what's in your pocket? Nothing. He started coming from behind the counter towards me. And I'm continually saying, nothing, I don't have anything. And as he got closer, I grabbed the loaf of bread and I ran out of the store and I ran all the way home. When I got home, Nanny asked where I had gotten the candy bar from. Now, maybe she knew me well enough. Or perhaps it was the look on my face or the stumbling over my words. I don't know. (laughs) I don't know what it was, but she knew I had stolen that candy bar. By Jangos, haven't I told you? Haven't I told you to always do what's right? After giving me a good whipping, (laughs) she walked me back to that store to return the candy and to apologize to the owner. Needless to say, integrity is probably my number one value. (laughs) Being a person who holds her principles is etched in my nervous system. Now, these are in no specific order, but the second lesson I learned from Nanny was persistence or to never quit. As I said, she was the only person in her family to migrate to California out of all of her siblings. All of her four children succeeded her in death. And it's my understanding that she lost two other children right after birth. I witnessed her live through some hard times, including fighting to keep her mind. But when I tell you that woman never quit, she never quit. She never complained. She just kept going. And she did it with such grace. She did it with a smile on her face. 
I I can recall or, or remember another, ex, I'll say event, another um, time that we had together, another memory. Um, and it, it was the first time I will say that I questioned her mental status. I was 13, so now I'm a teenager, not a five-year-old who um, is still in that childlike spirit. 13, I've seen some things and have my own opinions about things. But even though I was 13, I was still very close to my great-grandmother, and I loved being around her and with her. We went to, we, she wanted to go downtown one day. She wanted to go downtown to conduct some business. Nanny didn't have a car and going downtown meant at least a one hour bus ride. And depending on where she was going, it could have meant several buses that we would have to take. And on this particular day, it was cold, it was rainy, and she took me downtown with her. And I thought it was going to be a normal trip where we maybe go to the bank, stop by her favorite department store so that she could sit and have coffee at the counter and maybe visit the doctor. That is typically what we would do when we would go downtown. However, this trip was far from that. (laughs) We had a short visit to the doctor, took a bus to another doctor. Mind you, it's raining. Left that doctor's office, got on the bus went to another doctor's office, left that doctor's office, got on the bus, went to another doctor's office. And I began to wonder why each doctor told her they couldn't help her and why she was becoming, in her words, vexed (laughs) or upset. Um, The last doctor, I overheard that doctor say something about a facelift And he gave her a card. Now I was vexed, ready to go home. It was nearly dark. We were soaking wet. I looked at her and I asked, what's a facelift? She turned to me and said, "Hmm, I have what I want. We're going home now and you need not know anything more. (laughs) There was this contentment. And I picked up on her level of contentment. My lesson that day was don't quit. Don't quit until you get what you want. You may have to make many stops along the way, but if you keep going, you will eventually get what you want. And and that is the message I want you to take away in this moment. Don't quit. You may have to make many stops. You may have to go in and out of several doors, but know that if you continue, you will eventually get what it is that you want. The third lesson was to appreciate the small things. Now, this is the last story I'm going to tell you all (laughs) about my life because this one um, speaks to how spoiled I was as a child. I'm not sure that you can spoil a child enough, but something in me told me that this behavior was okay. So I was in the fourth grade and each morning when I would get up and get ready for school, before I left, my nanny would give me a quarter so that I could stop at the store, either on my way to or on my way home from school. I would go to the store and buy me a little candy And one morning, she didn't have a quarter. All she had to give me was 13 cents, a nickel and eight pennies. And I can still remember she was so sweet. She grabbed me by the hand and she said, baby, this is all Nanny have this morning. And she placed the coins in my hand. I looked down in my hand saw a handful of pennies and threw them on the floor. I want a quarter. Every day you give me a quarter. I want a quarter. And before I could take a breath, by Jangles, 
Now listen, you've heard me say that twice now. By Django's meant you were in trouble. <laughs> she was fed up and she was getting ready to get with your program. And immediately, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It was too late. What I knew, <laughs> there was no coming back from By Django's. By the time she hit By Django's, you were in trouble. So my lesson, <laughs> appreciate all things, no matter how small. We never know. It just may be someone's last. And as I reflect and think about my behavior in this story, oftentimes, even now, I feel so bad, like my heart hurts about that behavior. Like as a mom who has given her last, I can only imagine the pain of having it thrown on the floor. I can tell you, we never went down that road again. We never went down that road again. But what has stuck with me is to appreciate all things, no matter how small. Two more lessons. Many people describe me as no nonsense. And I, at one point, appreciated that description. At another time, wasn't so sure that I liked it. It sounded hard. And today, I say it is what it is. <laughs> I watched my great-grandmother challenge people who attempted to mistreat her. I watched my great-grandmother challenge people who attempted to mistreat others. I heard her say things like she would not stand for foolishness. And she didn't. She knew her boundaries and she would not allow anyone to cross them. So if being no nonsense means holding your boundaries, I will say to you, I will encourage you, be no nonsense. <laughs> be no nonsense. The last lesson I learned from my nanny was to have my own relationship with God. Every morning before doing anything else, she would sit at the dining room table and read her Bible. There were many times when she would look at me and say, baby, you've got to know him for yourself. Now, as a child, I did not know what that meant. But as I matured, as I entered adulthood, as I went through some things in life, I know exactly what she means by knowing him for myself. So the five lessons that came out of my history by way of my great grandmother, Nanny, is be principled and have integrity. Be persistent and never give up. Appreciate the small things. Don't accept foolishness. If holding your boundaries means being no nonsense, be no nonsense. And establish a relationship with the divine creator. Establish your own relationship with the divine creator. I call him God. Black history should not end with the month of February. I implore you to study not only African Americans' contribution to the United States, but also Blacks' contributions to you. I am who I am because of a black woman's contribution, my great grandmother, to my life. Not just hers, but she was definitely the most instrumental in my life. And I would venture to say that no matter your race, chances are great that an African-American has contributed 
to your life in one way or another. And I would offer that you share your stories. Share your stories here. Share your stories with others. As we begin to wrap, my prayer for you this week is that you will have a desire to seek and find the truth and full history of the United States of America. You will have a desire to seek and find the truth, a full history of your self. Get curious. Who's contributed to your life? And as I close, I want to remind you that in this life, we get to choose. So choose to listen from the place where your heart speaks and choose to live a sensational life. Peace and blessings. Thank you for listening to Where Her Heart Speaks with Coach Catherine, where Catherine aims to challenge and disrupt ineffective thoughts and behaviors to help you not only embody peace, joy, calm, and certainty, but also help you live the life you've always dreamed of living. Follow Catherine on Facebook and Instagram at I am Catherine James and visit www.catherinejames.com. Remember to live the life of your dreams. You must go within and return to the place where your heart speaks.